Good morning, and we're welcome to worship. This morning's call to worship is adapted from Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. Please stand and join me as we call one another to worship, reading responsibly. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, This is your true and proper worship. But be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we begin that life of worship here and now during this service of praise. We will sing together, come people of the risen king in a house of the Lord.
please be seated. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? We're doing good. Happy Sunday. We're in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're together. We're back. You know, we're not quarantining. Let's, let's be joyful that we are here together and, and uh, able to worship, whether we're here in person or whether we're at home, we are so glad that we can be together, singing together, raising our voices together. If you're uh, a guest this morning, we are so glad that you're here this morning, worshiping with us. Um, a couple quick things. Um, as you came in on the table, you may have noticed a couple of uh, colorful sheets of paper. Um, one is, I mentioned last week, an update from Dutchtown Outreach. So Ryan has provided one, so I appreciate that. So I want to encourage you to grab one of these uh, if you haven't already on your way out today, just to see what's going on uh, in Dutchtown and what Ryan and his ministry are doing and accomplishing and how to pray for them. And also, so we're trying something new today. So we have this nice little uh, half sheet of paper, and it has an order of worship, and it also has uh, some notes on the back. So this is a result of our welcoming committee. Uh, we had some folks go out and uh, check out some other churches and take some notes. And this is something we've done in the past, but we're like, hey, we want to bring it back. So we're trying it out. Let us know. Give Patty some feedback. Um, and so we may not have it every week coming forward, but at least we're trying something new. Uh, so if you're interested in the order of worship, be sure to grab one on your way out. It has the na name of the songs. Um, also, on the back, we mentioned, or I mentioned last week um, on our updates for our ministry partners about the Girl Scouts collecting some items for a women's shelter. And so those items are on the back of the sheet. So if you're interested, grab one of these on the way out if you haven't already. And uh, we need to have these by April 3rd, April 3rd. So be sure to bring those items and just uh, we'll have a table set up uh, next week uh, to collect those. Um, so those are coming up. We also um, have a church council meeting tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. in the library. Also, um, I wanted to remind you guys that the uh, GSA Middle School musical, The Lion King, they're preparing, they're sounding good. Um, and even whenever you go down for donuts and coffee afterward, that's also a plug for that too. Be sure to go down and get coffee and donuts after church. Um, they're set up. We have some tables set up on the, the fringes on the outside. Um, but we, that's also a reminder to come back this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at 7 p.m. it says... And cost is $3 to help support our middle schoolers uh, having a love of the arts. Um, one last thing. Um, there are uh, multiple ways to give. One of our ways that we worship is actually through our, our giving. God is so generous to us that one of the ways that we worship is that we give back. And there's a couple of ways that you, uh, you can give back this morning. We have a nice uh, box that you can put your tithe money in near the back. So as you leave today, you're welcome to be able to give an offering that way. We also have a new way. You can give online. And a couple of ways that are new in giving, if you're interested, is we have a benevolence fund. And that benevolence fund, what that does is it helps those that are in need. And so two easy ways to do that. If you're writing a check, uh, you can uh, just put it in the memo line and put it in the offering box. Or if you're giving online, uh, it has a drop-down menu and you can select benevolence. And that's, uh, that will go straight into that fund to be able to help others that are in need. Now, one of the things we do every week is we set aside time to pray for one another, uh, to lift up each other's burdens, but also to praise God for the things that he's doing in our life. So I just want to open it up uh, this morning, and if you're online, your prayers matter as well, so be sure to go ahead and mention it in the comments, and Patty will be sure to share it with us. So does anybody have any prayer requests this morning? Uh, yeah, Gary. So Gary's nephew, Bob, they had a, a house fire, and uh, so everybody's okay, um, but really scary, and uh, so just thankful that everybody's okay, and just pray, prayers for recovery from that. Yeah, Joe.
Okay. You said in Iraq? Ukraine. Okay. Trapped in Ukraine. Joe has a friend that's in the Ukraine and they're trapped and they're unable to get out. So just pray for your friends and those that are just uh, there. Yeah, continue to keep the Ukrainian people in your prayers. Carl. Okay, she did. So Carl's sister, and she was, what was her name again? Margaret. Margaret uh, was 96. Um, Carl's sister, Margaret, passed away this past Friday, 96 years old. And so, strong, strong lady. Carl and I were talking about her this week on Thursday, and uh, even, even how, how strong she was gripping Carl's hand was still <laughs> amazing, um, warming his hand up, he said. So, just be in prayer for Carl um, as they mourn the loss of his sister. Sherry? Andrew's traveling for spring break. Not fair. Why don't we get spring break? I mean, come on. I mean, they set us up, and uh, and so is he going far? Florida. So Harris going to be busy. They're they're expecting record numbers down there. So prayer for for everybody in Florida. So. So Cheryl's dad, Tuesday, has a procedure to replace the feeding tube, and it's never fun. And so just pray, prayers that everything goes smooth. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. So Dave's just asking prayers for Gary, as we talked about last week. He, he's having some struggles. He's... He's been struggling with his knee, uh, being uh, recovering from that, his knee surgery, but also they were finding that he had some thyroid issues. And so just prayers for endurance and um, just encouragement. So just want to encourage people to send out a message of encouragement to Gary that you're praying for him, and those uh, usually are good boosts. Yeah. Penny. I can understand that. If someone was messing with my heart, I'd be a little nervous too. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. Um, that was Penny's dad. It's going to have a pacemaker installed. Is that what we say? I guess that's what we say. <laughs> replaced. So it's replaced. It's already there. We're just taking one out. And so uh, so there's a little bit nervous anytime you're messing with the heart. And so, so just prayers for the doctors taking, taking care of that procedure. Dave again. I like it. Do it. So just uh, prayers for Dave's other son, Jim, and his uh, daughter-in-law, Amy, just as they're raising kids. Raising kids is somewhat challenging. So just prayers for encouragement and love and uh, for them and wisdom and discernment as they're, they're trying to, to lead their granddaughter. So that's good. Joe? Yeah, Joe's just asking for peace, um, not just globally, but also even locally, uh, wherever there's um, unrest and violence, that there could be peace. Good. Okay. Well,
let's take these prayers before the Lord this morning. Uh, God and Father, we, we thank you so much uh, that you are a God who loves us, that, that calls us into prayer. Father, prayer is such an intimate act uh, that we share our, our fears, our worries, our anxieties, and we, we cast them on you, Father, because you, we know that you care. We know that you are involved with every detail of our lives. And so, Father, I pray that you would uh, be with each of us. Many of us have many things that we need prayer for, and we don't always share them. But, Father, we know that you are involved in every aspect of our life. And so, Father, we bring these prayer requests to you. Father, there's so much going on not just in our local spheres, but also globally as well. So, Father, we just uh, pray that you would give us peace and we'd be able to rest in you. Father, we pray for those that are needing medical assistance. Father, that you would be, we're so thankful for our doctors, our nurses, our first responders. Father, we pray for wisdom and discernment, uh, whether you're having a feeding tube replaced or a pacemaker replaced. Um, Father, we pray that you would continue uh, to be with those doctors, nurses, and recovery of all of these ailments. Father, we pray, uh, we're thankful for uh, the, the safety of Gary's nephew, Bob, and, and their family as they had this fire. Father, we pray for all those in Ukraine, Father, that are struggling, that are uh, being displaced. Father, we pray for safety and uh, shelter and food for those uh, that are needing it, that are, are now sojourners. And so, Father, we pray that, that the generosity of others would, would help them to be able to point them back to you, Father. Father, we pray that uh, you be with Carl and his uh, family as they mourn the loss of, of Margaret. We pray, God, what a, a long life that is, and uh, what, what many stories that Carl and others have to share about a life well lived. So we, we just pray for those that are mourning the loss of Carl's sister this week. Father, we also, we want to lift up our time together this morning. Father, that it would be a time that glorifies you. Father, we pray uh, that you would prepare our hearts uh, to worship you. Father, we have so many things that are going on in each of our lives that you would help us to quiet our minds, quiet our hearts, and hear your voice. And so, Father, I pray that you would do a mighty work in each of us this morning. We pray all this in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Today we are looking at the Lord's Day 26 from the Heidelberg Catechism entitled Holy Baptism. Question 69. How does Holy Baptism remind us and assure us that Christ's one sacrifice on the cross benefits you personally? Answer. In this way, Christ in instituted this outward washing and with it promised that as surely as water washes away the dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and his spirit wash away my soul's impurity, that is, all my sins. Question 70. What does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? To be washed with Christ's blood means that God, by grace, has forgiven our sins because of Christ's blood poured out for us in his sacrifice on the cross. To be washed with Christ's blood to be washed with Christ's spirit means that the Holy Spirit has renewed and sacrificed us to be members, sanctified us to be members of Christ, so that more and more we become dead to sin and live holy and blameless lives. Question 71. Where does Christ promise that we are washed with his blood and spirit as surely as we are washed with the water of baptism? Answer. In the institution of baptism where he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. This promise is repeated when scripture calls baptism the water of rebirth and the washing away of our sins. Please stand, those who are able to stand. We'll sing by our love. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. And then after that, we'll sing what a friend we have in Jesus. Well, you can pray for your pastor this morning because I have uh, 
Apparently, I had more to talk about on uh, the spiritual discipline of community than I realized at the beginning of the week. And so whenever I started this, uh, this morning, I had 16 pages of notes. No, I'm just kidding. I only had 13. I really don't have even 13 pages. But still, all that to say is pray for me as I have a lot to cover in a limited amount of time. So we're just going to jump right in. If you would, turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Again, we are continuing our, our series on spiritual disciplines, and we are going to be talking about the spiritual discipline of community. Now, again, there's a lot to cover, and so while I found that I really want to get in the trenches and the weeds with you, I'm really taking, we're going to be taking a flight today. I'll be your flight attendant. We're going to be soaring at about 30,000 feet this morning, so we're going to be talking a lot about the generalities of community and the importance of community. And so we're going to be reading in Romans 12, verses 1 through 13. Now, typically this isn't a passage that we read on community. It's really a passage talking about living a Christian life. Even one of the subtitles um, or headings of the ESV Bible that I have says marks of a true Christian. But these components that I want you to listen for are the uh, ways that Paul is talking to the church in Rome and especially the commands he has as they love one another and how he refers to them. So again, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. It says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present, to your, bo- present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned For as one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, in service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the reading of your word this morning. Father, I pray that you would help us to be transformed by your spirit to become more like your son, Jesus. Father, I pray that we would be people welcoming new members into our community, into our tribe, Father, they would get to know you better, to love you more fully. And I pray that, Father, that you would help us to hear your voice clearly this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And really, that's what we're, we're doing as Christians, is that this isn't a sprint that we are in. It's actually a marathon. And so we are called to go together on this journey of faith to help support, to help encourage one another. And I love this passage because here I saw eight things that Paul said in this passage that we are called to do for one another. And one thing I notice is, one, he gives us a, a family name. He calls us brothers or sisters. So we have a common ancestry. 
We have a common mission, he says, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, which is our spiritual act of worship. We have common values. He calls us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. And the renewal of our mind is that from from godly values, from biblical values that is being transformed. We see that the people that he's talking to in Rome and us today, we have a common rank. There's not someone that's greater, that we are one body that has many members that have different functions. And all of our functions are working together for the same cause. Preaching every week is no higher than playing the piano, sending out a newsletter, folding the newsletter, serving and bringing in donations, giving. All of those are part of what God is calling us to be a healthy body with different functions. He calls us that our love must be authentic or genuine. That we're not supposed to to act like we love each other, not act like we have affection for one another. That oftentimes we see Christians do, which is where backbiting begins to happen. But we're supposed to have genuine love for one another. And he even says that we are to outdo one another in honor. So if someone honors me, I need to find a way to get them back and up the ante a little bit, outdo each other in honor. And I love that. And that's what we're called to do, that we are called to be in a community that is loving and serving each other so that we can go out into the world and love and serve those and bring them back to be part of our tribe. Just as the Great Commission that we just read about in the Heidelberg Catechism says that we are to go forward and to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, bringing them into the same tribe, into the same family. And we see this even that Jesus does this. Jesus has a community among him. Now, typically, when we think of Jesus and his community, what do we think of? We think of the 12, right? Actually, Jesus' community was bigger than the 12. Actually, the disciples that Jesus has, Scripture says that he sent out 70, or depending on the account, 70 or 72. Someone isn't good at math. But he sent out 70 disciples to go two by two into the countryside to reach others for Jesus. But, But Jesus had a smaller group of people, and those were the 12. Those were... The, the 12 that we read in Scripture, and they all had a purpose. But even within the 12, Jesus had his three. The 12 were the ones Jesus was discipling, training, equipping. That would actually, all 12 would go out around the world, and tradition tells us they would all be martyred for Christ. Preaching the name of Christ. The only one that wasn't killed which was John, was exiled to the island of Patmos and died there. But Jesus spent that time training the twelve, discipling the twelve, but he also had the inner core of three, which was Peter, James, and John. And we see those three going into more intimate times with Jesus. Uh, he went, they went with Jesus whenever they, he was raising Jairus' daughter. He was, they were also there at the transfiguration. But those were his guys that knew everything about him, that he went to with his troubles, that his worries. And those were his inner core. John, in his, in his gospel, refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so for us, that is the model that we have of community. That's the idea of fellowship that we need to have, is that we need to ask the questions, who are we discipling? Who are our people? Who is our tribe? Who are we investing into? And some of that's a bigger group of people. But also we need to have a select core. Those are the people that know everything about us. That you know whenever you're having that hard day, that you had that awful fight with your spouse, 
that you don't really want anybody to know, there's that one person you can call and say, hey, I need to talk. And you know they're going to answer or they're going to call you back as soon as you can because they're your person. They're there to help you, to encourage you, to give you perspective. And that's what we all need. Now, what we see in Scripture is we see that it's not good for man to be alone. So in the Genesis account, in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God created everything in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. We learned about that last week. You can go onto YouTube. You can re-listen to it. Hopefully you all were able to rest and find Sabbath this week. But on the seventh day, he rested. But out of everything he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. When he created man, he said it's very good. The first thing that God said that wasn't good was, it is not good for man to be alone. <clears throat> now, typically, this passage I use whenever I do weddings. If you uh, grew up in the youth group, you may have tried to cornerly use this in some pickup line that Christians awkwardly use. <clears throat> Hey, baby, you know that God created us not to be alone. Please don't do that. It doesn't help you or anyone else. And so oftentimes when we think of this verse, we think of it in context of romantic relationships. But we see in Scripture that God doesn't call us all to marriage. Elijah wasn't married. Paul wasn't married. Jesus wasn't married. And so what we see in Scripture is that it is important to note that it, it is not good for us to be alone. That God is calling us in to community, to be known. And for some of us, we hate that because we're introverts. And I don't like people. <laughs> and so, but it's important for us to pursue those that are alone, that are the fatherless, that are the widow, that are the divorced, that are the single, that we, we have a, a commonality of community that isn't just married couples or with kids, which oftentimes the church can emphasize. That sometimes the church has been accused, not this church, I'm just talking about the church generally, that we worship the family. And we focus too much on family to the exclusion of our friends that are single. And it's awkward for them to sometimes fit into that type of setting, that type of community, and that type of culture. But we need to make sure that we have a church that is accepting and welcoming not just of married couples, but of singles, of people of different cultures, of different backgrounds, of do different socioeconomic status. We want to have a diverse church in which the anchor and, or the common denominator is Jesus. I once had a pastor say the type of church we want is that we go into the church and we have people that doesn't look like you, smell like you, sound like you, that we want to have a diverse church with different expressions of the faith to help bolster each of us to love Jesus more fully. Because the more diversity we have, the more more ways that people push us out of our comfort zone, and the more fully we can love and appreciate Jesus in the same way other people can experience and love Jesus. So one of the questions, I hope you're writing all these questions down, um, a question that we need to ask is, are all people welcome to be part of this church so that we can point them back to Jesus we're go we'll come back to this idea a little bit later. Now, recently we have had a great realization of how important it is to be together. Because there for a time we were not allowed to meet together. 
And as I was preparing, one of the, one of the articles I found uh, talking about the importance of community was a social science journal article entitled, Psychological Consequences of Social Isolation During COVID-19 Outbreak. And it says this, Although necessary to limit the spread of the epidemic, in fact, human beings are not designed to manage segregation for a long time. As the Greek philosopher Aristotle reminds us, man is an essential, uh, is a social animal, unable to live isolated from others since the absence of relationships removes essential conditions for the development of personal identity and the exercise of reason. Although our first instincts may be to at, react angrily at people who pour out onto the streets, there's a need for more universal compassionate stance and recogni recognition that the very nature of the human being is in stark contrast with the situation we are experiencing. It goes on to say, moreover, research shows that the nourishment and movement besi besides being important therapeutic expedients are fundamental vehicles for communicating with ourselves, others, and the world, and have enormous influence on our <laughs> biopsychological balance. Prolonged isolation can adversely affect physical and emotional health, altering sleep, nutritional rhythms, as well as reducing opportunities for movement. As a result, the natural channels of human expression and ple uh, pleasure becomes depressed with attendant impacts on mood and subjective well-being. Suffice it to say, or to summarize, we need each other, and when we don't, it affects our sleep. I start eating comfort food because I miss my friends. I go to Cracker Barrel more if it's open, because that's where I get my comfort food. I eat more chocolate. I gain my COVID-15, or whatever the number was. I mean, we started strong. Remember, everybody was walking in outside like we were never going to be able to go outside again. My kids and I went to Tower Grove Park the first couple of days. I'd never seen that many people in Tower Grove Park. <clears throat> but then eventually I, need, I, I started eating my feelings and missing all of my friends, needing my hugs. We are social beings, and it's not just biblical, but God created us that, that way. That's why we need to check on one another, care for one another. It's important to meet together, to be known by one another, to feel safety and security. And this is why Christians, even in the past, would set aside their own physical needs for the whole as they lived in communities together, potentially sacrificing themselves for others. Or, whenever there was leprosy, Christians would sacrifice their well-being to be in these leper colonies to help serve, love, and care and potentially get leprosy themselves. And so, we are called to be a part of tribes. We are very tribal people. We all have different tribes that we're a part of. In fact, this week I was at a friend's house, um, and we, I was just picking him up, and, and his wife uh, and this was on Thursday, so I'd been reading about this, reading about tribes all week. And his wife had a shirt on, and her shirt said tribes. I was like, wow, what a coincidence. What, what, what tribe are you a part of? And she said that she's on a Facebook group that I think encourages working out. And they gave each other shirts that reminded them that they're a part of a tribe about working out and encouraging to be worked out. But this is a, a common theme that I see even in commercials or in marketing now, that we use the, the uh, phrase, this is my tribe, or find your tribe. Now, what is a tribe? And a tribe is a social division in a traditional society consisting of families or communities linked by social, economic, religious, or blood ties with a common culture and dialect typically having a recognized leader. Sounds very similar to Romans 12 that we talked about earlier. Common descent, a leader, common traditions like baptism, communion, singing songs, Sunday worship, Sabbath, disciplines. All of these things tie us together. 
So tribes possess general similarities, but recall each tribe have a unique way of carrying out their practices. And tribes are various sizes. They can be, I can associate with our country, that I'm a part of America's tribe, Missouri, and St. Louis. And every tribe, and that can even go to neighborhood, county, city, street, all of them can be be formed by a set of customs, practices, language. So, St. Louis has its own language it speaks. You may not know this. But generally, whenever you meet someone, if you're from St. Louis, and I'm not from St. Louis, you have this phrase that I don't quite understand of, Julie knows, what high school do you go to? I have no idea how to translate that. Some people say they went to Southwest. Some say they went to Bishop DeBerg. I don't know what that means. Congratulations for going to high school, but that doesn't help me at all. But you all know, <clears throat> we also have common food. Am I right? Ted Drew's, Emo's Pizza, toasted raviolis, right? Every time we have someone from our tribe go on any uh, late night talk show, that's what they want to talk about, whether it's it's uh, John Ham or Jenna Fisher. They bring Emo's Pizza to whatever talk show, and they're like, what is this? And then they make fun of us, and then we get all angry. You can't talk about Emo's Pizza that way. I know it tastes like cardboard, but I can say that, but you can't. Then we have certain types of language that we talk about. We talk about birds on bats. What is that about? We talk about RBIs. We talk about icons in our community. Stan the man, the wizard. We all know what that is because that's part of our tribe, the 314. They're trying to bring us a new area code and people are up in arms. No. We are the 314. Don't bring any other numbers in here. We're ready to go to war over three numbers. Seth Godin created a book about tribes. He sees this idea of tribes and disseminating information. And, and so I'm cheating. So there's a gentleman named Sam Davis that has a summary of his book. So Seth Godin wrote the book. Sam Davis gave me the, the summary. So I'm giving credit to both, okay? But he summarizes the book in three sentences. One, a tribe is a group of people connected to one another, connected to a leader, and connected to an idea. So our leader is Jesus. Uh, we're connected together by the idea of the gospel saves us, and we perpetuate that, right? Second, a group needs two things to be a tribe, a shared interest and a way to communicate. Welcome to our way to communicate. We talk to each other, eat donuts, drink coffee. We see how each other's doing, okay? That's, that's the second thing. Third thing, <coughs> tribes need leadership. Our leader is Jesus, not me. Thank God, but we also have a council. Uh, sometimes one person leads, sometimes more. People want connection and growth and something new. They want change. And ultimately, whenever we are participating in the gr uh, Great Commission, that's what we're doing. We are bringing people into our tribe. Come be a part of this leader who loves us so much, he died for us. That is restoring us to his father who created us. That he brings peace, hope, love, joy to all who worship him. Come be a part of that. Now the problem with tribes that we've seen over the last several years is there's good and bad. Now one of the ways that we communicate now is through social media. Now social media can be great because it helps us connect to find great quilting patterns. It helps us to find uh, things that we're interested in. One of the, the weird things is that there's a thing called furries now where that people like to dress up like mascots, and so they run around with, with basically full gear costumes or, or mascot costumes. I don't know what it is, Leanne. It's weird. But somebody likes it. They can connect, find community there. But also we have... Um, some, some things on the in, uh, internet that is false information or like what we like to say is fake news, right? So we have to be concerned or we have to question what we get. Now, the problem is, is that anytime I use some words, we have a connotation. 
I use a word for fake news and everybody's radar goes up. Like, wait, what's, what's pastor going to say? And so the point is, is that we all have tribal connections outside of the church and we bring those tribal connections into the church. And the problem is sometimes those outside connections, those outside tribes, affect or infect the inside tribe. And so what happens, especially over the last three years, we see more and more tribes diverging. And so I can use a certain type of words, and I'm like a magician. I can make your heart rise just saying some words. So if you have those trackers on your wrist, you can start watching your heart rate go up. I, I use the word mask. Vaccine. I'm not even going to try to say any type of president. I use the words justice, race. All of a sudden, our ears are perked, and we're like, what is he going to say next? And generally, what we do is we try to trace it back to what tribe they're a part of by if we ask the questions what they believe about any of those words, we get a response, and then we know what tribe outside of the church they're a part of. Because if they say a particular response, we know whether they listen to CNN, CNBC, or Fox News, right? And so we are divided where we get information. We trust those information, and if we are not careful, we bring that into the church, and our church can be divided, not because of Christ, not because of doctrine, but because of other issues. Not saying that those other issues aren't important, but they're not Christ, and Christ crucified. That's why in today's passage, in verse 2, it said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So we bring those ideas back and say, what is important about how do we love God and how do we love others? How do we care for others? Now I'm going to give kudos to the men's Bible study. It was a great lesson this week. Harry's doing a good job leading. Nine o'clock on Thursdays, if you have time, come check us out. But this week was a challenging passage. It was the first chapter of Isaiah. Who knew? Right from the offset, it's going to challenge us. But here you have a prophet, Isaiah, trying to bring the, the nation of Judah back to God, to repent of its corruption, to repent of its oppression. And so we have these verses. Verses 16 and 17, wash yourselves, make yourself clean, remove the evil deeds from before my eyes, cause to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. All important, all the heart of God. This is what God wants Israel to do. And sometimes we have a hard time hearing these things, and it's challenging. It was challenging for us on Thursday. To hearing a, a, a nation that is being accused of oppression, that is not seeking justice, that is not speaking up for the marginalized, the fatherless and the widow, the two folks on the outer skirts of society that don't have a voice. They are the voiceless. God's saying, who is speaking up for them? How are you bringing in, them into your tribe, into your community? How are you advocating for them? It was challenging for me. So, we have to have the same mind, same value, and same hope in Jesus. Now, we may not all believe the same things. Some of y'all are Cubs fans. I'm praying for you. That's a separate tribe. But I'm not going to excommunicate you for, for being a Cubs fan. Although, there may be times that I may be tempted. But God is calling us into unity. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 says this. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort uh, from love, any part uh, participation in spirit, any affection and sympathy, 
complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have a diverse interest to love and to be interested in what others are interested in. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. It's not about what I want. It's about what Jesus wants. Sorry, I'm, I'm condensing some of this. First Peter 3, 8 and 9. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, reveling or reviling, but on the contrary, bless for those for this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. There's five keys that Peter gives there. Remember these. Unity of mind, sympathy for one another, brotherly a love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Is that who we are? Now, we need to be aware of divisions that creep in among us. Diedrich Bonhoeffer says this, The person who loves their dream of community will destroy community, but the person who loves those around them will create community. Some of us have a picture of what community is. Some of us have a picture of what church needs to be. If we're rigid in that, then we're going to divide and alienate people. But if I love people and want to bring them in and want to hear them and give them a voice and give sympathy, brotherly love, and humility, I will create community. Romans sixteen seventeen. Paul later on in this book says this, or 17 through 20, says this, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who will call, cause divisions and create obstacles. Contrary to the doctrine that you have been, a taught, been taught, avoid them. For such persons do not serve the Lord, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all that rejoice, so that all re may rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent and to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Paul, divisions isn't anything new. Paul is calling us to avoid divisions. Finally, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 1, 10 through 13 says this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, that you are united in the same mind of the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is this, that each of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. We are baptized in Christ. Christ is our anchor. So, friends, whenever we create tribes, what our mission is, is to go out and to bring people into our tribe. That we love God, that we want to care for our community, our inner community, and our outward community, and we want to serve St. Louis or wherever God has placed us. That is what God is calling us to. That is what we are driven to whenever God, in the Great Commandment, when Jesus says in the Great Commandment, go out and make disciples. You are the leader in your tribe. Bring people in like Jesus, inner group, outer group. Disciple them to love Jesus, to know Jesus, help them to know the catechism, bring them to baptism, bring them to repentance, to trust in God, and that is what we're called to. So here's a few questions just to consider this week. How are you praying for this community? We've been talking about prayer. We've been talking about community. How are you praying, one, for this community to be healthy, there's no divisions, that we're growing in unity? That's one thing. How are you praying for people to become part of this community? How is God calling you to bring people into this community? Are you praying for the five things that Peter talked about? Praying that we have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. If you were to grade us right now, how would you grade us? How would you grade yourself? And how are you modeling community like Jesus? And where do you need to grow? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are calling us into a community together. Father, it's not an accident that every people in this room and on online are woven together through your son, Jesus. Father, that we are all here 
celebrating what you're doing, what you've done in us and through us by adopting us as your children. Father, I pray that you would help us to be more unified, that you would help us to be more missional, to go out, to bring people to become part of our tribe. Father, I thank you for what you've done in this church and through this church, and I pray for what you're continuing to do inside each of us and what you will do in our community because of us. So, Father, I pray that you bless us. May it change each of us. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us, those who are able to stand. We'll sing together. Heal us, Emmanuel. We'll sing the first two verses. Again, what a blessing it was to be here in your midst today and worshiping the Lord together with you. Whether you're here in person or whether you're at home, we're so glad that you could join us today. A couple quick things. Be sure to grab one of these on your way out. If you didn't, it has all of our list of items to be collected for the women's shelter for the Girl Scouts. And also to grab your copy of the Dow Dutchtown Outreach, uh, the ministry update from the Irwins, uh, just to know how to pray for them. Also, we're having a VBS meeting this uh, right after service uh, downstairs. So if you're interested in serving in that, I encourage you to come on down. Um, that was Bob Barker uh, right there. Come on down. Here we go. Good old Bob. May you rest. So our um, benediction is found today in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, it's verses 2 through 5, and it says this. God, may you complete our joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in, in full accord and of one mind. God, may we do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, may we count others more significant than ourselves. May we, each of us, look not only to our own interests, but the interests of others. And may we have the mind among ourselves, which is ours in Christ Jesus. May we go in grace and peace today. Thank you.